So Tom, we have to update some of those numbers. Yeah. I think it's it's like forty-four million dollars yeah. of charity. And That's absolutely right. We're just under fifty million donated. About a quarter billion people uh, uh, running our programs, from you know diaper recycling in Amsterdam to chewing gum in Mexico, and, and so on. Chewing gum, cigarette butts, toothbrushes, everything you always thought you had to throw away. That's right. You can now recycle. So I want to start with recycling because this is incredibly fascinating. When you look at the amount that is actually recycled, there was a fantastic uh, piece in Science Advances, the journal, that looked said that out of all the waste that we've created, the plastic waste, only 9% has been recycled. I've seen figures as high as 14%, but that doesn't seem too successful. And in fact, you are the king of recycling and you call it a failing yeah. business model. Absolutely, and I think the nine or 14% is generous uh, at that. Um, the real issue is, and I'm, you know, we've read about this in many different papers, uh, uh, that the recycling industry from a macroeconomic point of view is in collapse, more or less. And that's because of three uh, major reasons. The obvious ones are low oil prices, so it's hard to compete against virgin plastics and virgin materials. The second is the end markets, like China, but now not just China, but many other uh, countries in the APAC region and so on who used to import all the material have stopped, for the right reasons, mind you. Um, that's taken away 50% of the demand market, wow. which is a horrendous thing if you're a, a recycler in anywhere from Japan to Europe to here. But the third is the most unintuitive, which is the quality of the, of the materials we put in the waste stream is becoming significantly lower. Uh, recyclers make money on what's sort of like a profit per touch, and packaging is becoming significantly lighter. So you have to collect now 10 bottles for what used to take one bottle uh, 10 years ago. And it's becoming more complex, which means you have to put more resource, uh, more processing resource against extracting that limited value. And basically, just less things, less things, less things are becoming recyclable, in, and that's in the, in the middle of a garbage crisis at the very same time. <laughs> and it's so light, the plastic, that it's actually flying off the conveyor belt. Absolutely. That, yeah. Some bottles are becoming so light, they're now viewed as almost flexibles, which means they're not being recycled. Right. And it's so sensitive. You know, what makes something recyclable is not about technical mousetraps or the technical ability to do something. It's simply about economics. You know, uh, garbage companies that were partly owned uh, in Europe by Suez or here in uh, Canada by Waste Connections, these large waste management companies, and they're looking to mine your waste. So if they can make a profit, it's recyclable. If they can't make a profit, your waste will be not recyclable. It's that simple. So one sort of, uh, to show you how thin that line is, a clear soda bottle like this, which is made from PET, is recycled in Europe in most cases. But if you add a little color to this, just make it green, which many bottles are, from sparkling water to carbonated soft drinks, that added pigment takes the value down just enough to make it now not recyclable anymore. It's that thin, the line. So this business model essentially has collapsed since you began your effort at TerraCycle in 2001. And you, you had this big aha moment, which was that you were in Canada and you opened up uh, the closet of a friend's uh, home and you saw the pot plant that had been struggling forever and you, it, suddenly it was flourishing and you realized this was worm poop That's that right. was, was doing this and you thought, this is how you started your entire yeah. recycling business, taking compost and recycling it through through worms. What's the aha moment sure. that you've just had? Because it, it is radically different yeah. from... Absolutely. It's very different than growing better pot, for sure. Yeah. Um, now we know the pot smokers in the room, just yeah. maybe. Um, no, all joking. So you know, that's uh, why I asked the question. That's right. That's right. We wanted to get everyone out. Um, just this past January, actually at Davos at the World Economic Forum, we announced a new platform uh, in collaboration with most of the world's biggest producers, uh, from European G, Unilever, Coke, Pepsi, all the way to Shell and, and others, uh, as well as major retailers from you know Carrefour, Tesco, and so on, uh, to try to think about how to solve waste at the root cause because recycling is a good solution to the symptom of waste, uh, but it's not solving the root cause of waste. I mean, academically, you, if you look up the word recycling in any dictionary, the word waste must be present. So it's the best way of managing waste, but it's not solving waste. Mm -hmm. And so we went on a journey, this was actually two years ago, this also was spawned out of uh, the World Economic Forum when we launched the Big Ocean Plastic Initiative in 2017, and we were starting to talk with producers about how do we go a step deeper, uh, and how do we solve waste at the root cause, and the landing or the landing point we got to was that the root cause of waste is using something once. Mm -hmm. And so it's not plastic that's the big evil. We like to project everything that it's anti-plastic. Well, it's think pretty it, evil though. Well, no, because no, but it also makes you live longer. It also is what you're sitting on. It's what you're standing on. Right. It's what you're driving in. I mean, the world is a plastic world. I think the issue is if we took this carpet and threw it out after one use, right. that would be pretty bad. Or the chair after you sat in it once, that would be pretty bad. This you're gonna throw out after right. one use. Right. And that's the problem, right? So 
Now, why do we love disposability? And not just, by the way, in consumer goods. Like, look at all the disposable coffee cups we voted for right here when you had perfectly good ceramic mugs to choose from, right? I mean, just thank you for the prop. We prepped on this ahead it's, of time. Uh, but it's great. You know, but do you know what, why we did that? And everyone here is enlightened to it, and yet 50% of the audience voted for disposability? Yeah. It's because it's so f amazingly convenient and affordable. Right. And that has dem you know, democratized products. It's made you know, people who can access, say, you know, shampoo and soap be able to access it. But it's created this huge crisis. And also, I'd argue the quality of products has gone down in the process. You know, things are becoming cheaper and you know, less investment per unit. So you said you wanted to solve for disposability. You wanted yes. to give people the affordability and convenience that, that this offers, yes. or those coffee cups, yep. <clears throat> without the, the downside of that. Well, right, and what's the yeah. downside is a more expensive and even a less convenient. So there's been many reuse models out there. Right. I mean, Loop is not the first one, but every single one well, relies. Well, tell us what Loop is, because I'm not oh, yeah, sure, sure everyone knows that. So Loop is the, is, is the platform. Uh, you can le learn more about it in the US at loopstore.com or loopmagazine.fr in France. We're launching in about 10 countries over the next 12 months, and it basically is an engine for producers to be able to create uh, durable versions of their products. So everything from you know, Tide and Cascade all the way to haagen and Tropicana, all these sort of consumer goods, where instead of the consumer buying the product and owning the package, and I would argue you know, to the gentleman who raised his coffee cup, do you want to own that cup <laughs> when you're done drinking it? Yeah. Are you going to cherish it for many years? It's your property. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you go. <clears throat> but it's yeah. weird, right? You own it, it's your property, and yet you don't want it. Right. Isn't that a weird thing? And most of what we buy falls into that category. Uh, so by shifting the ownership back to the producer, uh, uh, some amazing things happen. These were the aha moments that you were driving yeah. at is that then they become financially motivated to make the package as long-lasting and durable as possible, not as cheap as possible, because what's in the price of the content isn't the entire package. So in, the, you know, in a coffee, when you buy it, the entire price of that cup is in the coffee, or the entire price of the water is in this bottle, but if you borrow it, it's just the depreciation of the durable package. So now you're in a financial situation where you want to make it as long-lasting and durable. Now what's beautiful about that is long-lasting and durable doesn't just enable reuse, which is great for sustainability, but enables the most epic, unparalleled design innovation that's ever been possible before. Right. I mean, <clears throat> the, the packages that these producers, from the new haagen container all the way to the new Tide container, and hundreds and hundreds of in-between, are, you know, many have called them the best versions of those packages ever invented, and nothing even close. They're pretty slick. Yeah. <clears throat> There's a Clorox cleanup that looks absolutely gorgeous. It's stainless steel. Yes. And, yeah. yeah. So now you've partnered with Nestle, Unilever, yeah. P&G, um, every, every major yeah. brand. The supermarkets that are part of this are Walgreens and Kroger here, here in Carrefour. The US, yeah. yep. Tesco in, 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 in the UK. I mean, this, these are all the big yeah, players. That's right. How did you convince them to change their business model? Because essentially what this is, is they now own the package. Yes, yes. And in fact, you're arguing that they should treat this as a depreciable asset on their balance sheet, which is incredible. That's exactly right. And they've all made that shift. So today, packaging is a cost of goods sold, right? right. And it's effectively a throwaway cost. So the goal is to reduce that cost, which makes things less recyclable and less exciting. Mm -hmm. In a durable, yes, you have a bigger financial outlay at the front, but you're making an asset that depreciates over the total number of uses, not even to zero, but to the material value of that object. Right. And uh, uh, the, the reason organizations have jumped on in a pace that I've never seen, I mean, we're adding a big mega brand every two days, a regional brand every 12 hours. Re we just launched, uh, announced Loblaw as the big Canadian retailer just a few days ago. And uh, the reason is twofold. One is that the, the current paradigm of consumer goods is a downward trend on margin and a downward trend on consumer delight. Everything will end up as a pouch one day. And how exciting is that? Right? And then you can't really differentiate either. Uh, as a producer, you're differentiating on your two-dimensional artwork, not on anything more than that. Here, you're, you can, the real major play was unlocking this fierce ability to innovate, where, like that Clorox container you described, keeps yeah. your wipes wet longer. You know, the haagen container does all sorts of amazing features, never available before in a coated paper pack, which is what ice cream pints are today packaged in. So this monster opportunity for innovation, Oh, and by the way, foundationally solves waste, and everyone's in a waste crisis. Uh, right. Greenpeace put out a list of the top 10 contributors to the plastic crisis. Nine of those are loop partners, and the 10th one is in, in dialogue. We'll get to 10 out of 10 very so soon. When you, so when you have your haagen and you finish your haagen what do you do with that container? Well, this is the key, I think, in any sustainability message, is it has to be 
fiercely simple and as convenient or more than uh, the, the current paradigm. If we're gonna ask people to change, it's gonna be the more we change, the less success the system will have. And so we want you to echo the behavior of disposability because the most convenient thing to do with the crap in your home is to throw it unsorted, uncleaned into a, into a pile. Now the negative of doing that is where it ends up. The action of doing that is not bad per se. The fact that it ends up in a landfill is the problem or an incinerator if you're in Europe or other markets. So there, you, in loop two, you throw them all dirty, no sorting, nothing into a bin. And that bin ends up with us as a reuse uh, center where we sort it, clean it, provide it back to all the primary manufacturers. So you collect it. it, UPS, you have a loop bag, it's very cool, yep. you throw it in, yep. Yep. UPS picks it up, you don't even think about it. It, right. it kind of conjures up the ideas of the old milkman. It totally does. Come. I won't ask you who remembers anyone, that here. I am um, curious yeah. to see if anyone <laughs> had a milkman growing up. There we, yeah, go. We, there we go. That's actually a pretty yeah. a fair number. I, I had one. So it, here's the point, it worked. Yeah. It's, yeah. nothing, it's just a reboot of an old idea. Now, here's the interesting part. The next, you asked about right. ahas, right? The first aha was unlocking design. Mm -hmm. The next one, which we're really just opening up the sort of the, the box on, is with reuse, you have a direct relationship with the consumer's actual use product, which is really profound. So that becomes as simple as, in any shopping environment, you know what your consumer bought. But in an environment like this, I also know what you returned. And the right. difference between the two is what's in your home. Sets up like an interesting function, for example, that will be live later this year, is you'll be able to uh, opt in to get an alert 10 days before anything in your home expires. So that you're alerted to say, hey, that pasta sauce is gonna go bad. Maybe you should have some pasta today instead of throwing it out in two weeks. That's so do I want Nestle to know how much Ben and Jerry's ice cream I'm eating? Or, well, Unilever yeah. would know how much Ben and Unilever Jerry's you're eating. But, uh, but, uh, <laughs> do I yeah, want, that's yeah. right. No, Unilever. no, but all joking yeah. aside, um, uh, uh, it's about what you can enable for yourself. Yeah. Self, right? Yeah. So the most profound version of this is there turns out that there's certain waste streams that carry diagnosable samples on them. Now think how big 23andMe and those, you know, uh, Ubiome right. and other companies have gotten. Your used motor oil carries your engine scrapings. Your cat litter carries your cat's urine sample. Your child's diaper carries your child's fecal matter. All of those can be diagnosed uh, when they come in if I know it's yours and then give back to you really interesting information. So this is an odd transition. I want to go from fecal matter to the capitalist society, but, but we- Is it odd or maybe, maybe yeah, not, right? Yeah. Well, no, because we, we've had this long conversation about the challenges of capitalism and how in crisis it is yeah. or whether it is yeah. in crisis or not. Your, your story is you actually, your family was in Hungary. Yeah. You fled Hungary after the Chernobyl accident. Any of you who've seen the Chernobyl miniseries can understand why. Um, you went, traveled in Europe before you ended up in Canada. And when you got to the United States, you talked about this as being this sort of bastion of big ideas, that yeah. where anything is yeah. possible. And then you built a business, basically, in the most unusual business model ever, uh, with, with this worm poop, yeah. as, as, as you're famously known. I, you know, you've discovered the, the bounty of, of the way our system works. How would you see it now? Uh, you started the business in 2001. Is the system in crisis? Yeah, you, I, you know, I, I, for me, like I was born in communism and right. landed in capitalism. And uh, I think there's virtues of both, by the way. You know, uh, both sides likes to vilify the other, but there are virtues of both. Um, to me, what really attracted me to business is I think business is the most powerful tool for change, bar none. It's been more powerful than politics, than disease, than war. It, imagine as a global CEO, many of you in the room, you can snap your finger on how many lives do you change the next hour, you know, uh, versus process and so on that has to take place. What, that to me was really exciting. What was less exciting, remember this so clearly, first year at Princeton, you know, Econ 101, the professor gets up, this is the very first class, and asks, what's the purpose of business? And the answer that uh, she was looking for was profit to shareholders. And I, I, profit's critically important, don't get me wrong. I'm a diehard capitalist, I think it's important, but is that the point? And I think if we make that the point, then it's gonna veer us in very difficult directions. And if you think about, you know, when was America at its height, because it isn't at its height anymore, it was uh, in the 1950s, 1960s, where the tax rate just kept going up and you had a phenomenally powerful middle class, because the middle class is who buys everything. And if I look at it now, you know, it sort of feels to me like what you know, our history books say, Russia was like you know, uh, 30 years before, the, you know, when the czars lived there, before the revolution, where the power balance went so desperate. And man, I mean, everyone here has got all the guns. It's got all, you know, at some point it's gonna tip over. And I think it's really important that we think about how to uh, bring up the middle class and not have a class of elite and a class of extreme uh, poverty. 
uh, because that's also going to make the economy work <clears throat> way better. Um, and I think there's a lot of rules, you know, roles for making sure we're protected. And there's yeah. some level of regulation within this, you know, amazing mode of, you know, you get to create what you want. I mean, in other countries, you can't just have a dream, work hard, and be successful. That's a uniquely American idea. Well, on that, thank you very much, Tom Zaki. Fantastic conversation. Thank you. It was wonderful.